My name is Stacy Brown, and I am presenting today on eating disorders. Um, I call the presentation Hope and Recovery. When I um, think back to high school, I think about eating disorders, and I think that we um, kind of all whispered about it like we do cancer and said, oh, we just got an eating disorder. Uh, because we didn't really think that it, there was hope, that we thought once you got an eating disorder, you just had one. So we know that's not to be true anymore. My clicker doesn't want to work. <laughs> so again, uh, calling it a journey of hope. a journey of hope because it really is a journey when you start to recover from anything, but especially um, eating disorders. Uh, we know that there is quite a problem. Um, we have that it is chronic. Um, it, there is late onset. We are going to talk mostly about teenagers because we're in high school right now, but we are seeing um, people of an older age starting with eating disorders, which is kind of disconcerting. Um, People always ask me, like, what started the eating disorder? Or when I have a client, the parent always wants to know, well, what is the problem? Why do they have this? And then if we can solve the problem, then we can do, they'll just be better. Um, unfortunately, I often call it a perfect storm because there is so many factors. Um, there is a genetic factor. There, we often see that they have um, lacking of coping skills, um, temperament. You know, some we I have three children, and I know other people with more than one child, you will raise them all the same, but you will see that they have different behaviors, they have different experiments. So <laughs> some people can handle a little more stress, a little more anxiety, some people can't. Um, obviously trauma of any sort uh, can be a problem, a lack of coping skills, and then even um, maybe being more influenced by dieting or the discussion of the dieting at a young age. Uh, we often see that it has a lot to do with like the body image, like having already decided that they like or don't like certain body parts and maybe more discussion about that again. And we see that there's quite a few people who have, it's more stomach than probably any other body part, but they have already decided that they don't like their body or body image. And then we always talk about media. Um, we see a lot in social media now, but even on TV and we hear a lot on the radio about quick weight loss, um, gyms, uh, plastic surgery, um, weight loss programs, and those kind of things, and that obviously influences our young people, and us older people too. And then the beauty industry, we see um, so much emphasis on looking your best and um, taking care of wrinkles and making everything look perfect and being perfect. Price of beauty, nine million dollars spent on products. It's a multi-billion dollar industry in the medical field, specifically um, co cosmetic surgery, um, anti-aging products, and then weight loss industry, 66 billion dollars. So because of all the money that they're making off it, we pretty much know that that's not gonna go away. It's not, we're not gonna stop seeing that. And then we have a lack of um, good role models industry. So there is a couple of them that have started to say, um, don't put me in a magazine um, photoshopped or I don't, um, I want all of everything to show and stuff like that. Um, there are only a few young people and then it's really hard to admit to everyone that you have an eating disorder because people start to um, have a voice about that and say, oh, what's wrong with you? Why do you have an eating disorder? What's wrong? You know, why are you doing this? And question you about it. And so it's hard for our young people to tell everybody that that's what's going on for them. So they may be suffering pretty badly and wanting to reach out to others, but then they don't want to be ridiculed. Um, and we talked about some of the stressors. Divorce is a big one. Um, moving. I um, spent most of my time working with people from the Woodlands, and there is a lot of movement in that area, especially since there's a lot of um, oil industry people, so they're moving from different countries and different states. And that on young people is pretty difficult. Um, any sort of loss, so even just like 
losing a dog or losing a parent or losing um, a boyfriend, so breakups and friendships. Um, one of the hardest things that I see too is the mean girl kind of thing where um, they'll all be on a group text message and um, you think everybody is with you and then you find out there's actually another group message where they're, they've excluded you either to talk about you or just because you're just not part of the group anymore. And then there's never any real um, resolution to that. Like, why did I get dropped out? Why are they in a group without me? And then once you lose those friends, who do you sit with at lunch? Um, who do you go to um, the library with? Who do you go to the football game with? Who do you hang with in the morning? I'm going to shut the door. Um, drug use to be um, part of this too, although it doesn't have to be. Um, we have two different types. The, kind of the type A would be our um, anorexic children and then our um, bulimics. So our anorexics you're going to see are more the perfectionists. Perfect grades, um, they get along with everyone, they kind of do whatever is asked of them. You don't really see them acting up, if you will, so it's a surprise to parents when they are experiencing this because they really aren't the squeaky wheel of the child that gets in trouble or whatever. But Lamex are a little more out of the norm. They're a little more um, hostile to use, to have drug use and that kind of stuff. They're a little more to overdo things and maybe stay out late and all those kind of things. So you have kind of two different types and we sort of think that if someone's going to have a problem, they're going to be in trouble in a lot of other areas in life, but we don't always see that when we have eating disorders. Um, relationships. Uh, we are in this age group in high school trying to figure out who we are, um, who we want to hang out with, what kind of friends we want. And obviously we find that friends are pretty important if they are um, a good influence or a bad influence that may sway our children one way or the other. So obviously we try to help them find good friends. Um, and good role models, we said again, it's hard to find those people out in the media that are really putting themselves out there and trying to give good role models. Uh, for our children. And then mortality too, like you start to realize in high school maybe you're losing grandparents or whatever and having that loss that you are not going to live forever. So that's a bit of a scary thing to face too. Um, and puberty and obviously we, um, the, the having a period and those kind of things are a big deal. Um, you're experiencing that maybe for the first time or you're trying to figure out how that works in the world. There's a lot of emotional changes due to the hormones during high school. Um, and then we also see that maybe if you don't want to grow up, if you don't want to become a woman, you can save it off by not eating. And so you don't have a lot of the hormonal changes, you don't have a period, you can lose all of that and then kind of that Peter Pan, stay young forever. Um, but that's not really what we want for them. We want them to grow up and be young women and everything. So uh, family history is a factor. Uh, we have predominantly white people who experience this, although it is going out through all of our different um, cultures. Poor nutrition, low body weight, excessive dieting, and then the life transitions, like we said, loss or moving or those kind of big things. Um, for treatment, it is, we try to hit from a lot of different angles. We want that, obviously they need good nutrition. Um, one of the things that you want is you can't make good decisions if you're not feeding your brain. So we try to talk to them about what they're doing and why they're doing it, and yet we can't find that they're making good decisions because if your brain is starved, you're not going to make the best decisions. So in terms of parents, so we put them in charge of the nutritional lab. We also have nutritional counseling where they make up meal plans so that the girls are eating the right amount of food. Um, also, we want that they check with the doctor because if they have lost uh, menstruation, we want to make sure that we can start that back up again. And then just general health, um, that they see a physician for all of that. Um, and then counseling will be uh, family counseling for young people. If they're married, it could be marital counseling. Anybody who could really help benefit from understanding what's going on and then how to help them in the future. Um, individual counseling, um, 
the girls that I work with typically like the individual counseling. They like group counseling. They're not big on family because they've been fighting a lot of this and they don't want to share that with everybody and yet you get into family counseling and we're going to all talk about this now. Um, that's not fun. Um, group is not so bad. Nutritional counseling is really, really not fun because that's where we're talking a lot about what they're doing, what they're not doing, and how to bridge that gap. So that's facing a lot of those demons of what's going on. Um, and what we see is that instead of dealing with a lot of the emotions, they are eating or not eating. So instead of going there and dealing with what's really going on inside, they are wanting to save off things and not do things. It does bring a lot of attention to them too, so we see that um, that's an issue also. Um, but then in counseling, trying to teach them how to have those coping skills, how to deal with what's going on in their life and how to make things better. Um, not always easy for them. Uh, in the group, it's really good because they get to see that other individuals are dealing with the same sort of thing and that they're not so out of the norm of what they're doing. And then how others are, are coping with that and then that support from each other. And hopefully in the family, that's the, what we're trying to get to too, not just that it's confronting them, but also that we can figure out how to support them as um, best we can. Um, when they with the dietitian again, we're going to be looking at um, the proper nutrition. So there's apps that they can plug in what they're eating, and that way the nutritionist can see that they're doing what they need to do. Um, but it's they may be going from having maybe a meal a day or eating one thing at each meal, and now we're going to ask them to eat six times a day. So they have three meals and three snacks. So it's a big difference from what they've been doing to what we're doing now. And then obviously if they're bulimic and they're purging, we're going to ask them that they discontinue the purging. So people are watching them. Um, when we have group counseling, we will eat with them first, and they'll have their food plated for them, so they have to eat everything that's on their plate, which is difficult. And then we go to the restroom, and then we do group. So we go to the restroom. I have to stand in the restroom to make sure that someone is purging. And so again, that's not something they particularly like to do, but those who have been inpatient for a long amount of time, they've been watched very carefully for a very long time. So me just kind of standing in the doorway is not quite as offensive. Um, and then watching, uh, we can't use a lot of numbers, so we don't want to say what is your weight and where you need to go. We kind of say you're on target or you're getting there, you're getting close, because they get really hung up in the numbers. Um, their eating disorders very much telling them how you should, you're doing well, you're not getting weight, or you're needing more, or whatever. And then with the parents kind of giving them that education of not saying like, oh, you look like you're better, or you look like you're gaining weight, or any of that kind of stuff, because that kind of talk kind of feeds more into that eating disorder, like, oh, people are noticing, I need to stop doing this, and that kind of thing. So we are focusing more on who they are on the inside. Again, discovering who they are, um, the talents, the skills, their success in education and all those kind of things to see more of who they are instead of just with the eating disorder. When you ask someone to see themselves, especially if they've really been doing the eating disorder for a long time, to see yourself without the eating disorder, it's kind of an empty feeling because they feel like that's been such a part of their life and that's part of who they are that it's scary to say, oh, you don't get to have that anymore. It's like that security blanket. Even though it's not helping them, come on in. It might make them feel better that they have that around them. Um, behavior, like I said, we're trying to cease those behaviors. Good afternoon. Um, we've kind of moved through kind of the basic stuff and we're kind of talking more how to treat um, eating disorders. So feel free if you have any questions. I know we're just kind of catching you up quick. Um, with the emotional cues, it's really interesting because you'll see that they have become so numb that they're not feeling the hunger feelings anymore or the fullness feelings anymore. And so that's a big cue for us. If we have emotional cues, if we're feeling blue, that usually means there's things going on in our lives that we should really address. If we are hungry, that means our body is telling us, hey, I need this, I need this. And so if you're ignoring all of that, you're really disconnected to not only yourself but to others. Um, and so we're trying to get them back in touch with those fullness feelings and those hunger feelings and then even those emotional feelings, which is scary because you've really used that eating disorder to deal with the emotional stuff so you haven't had to go there. Um, obviously with trauma, that's really helpful for them because they cannot deal with the trauma and they can use the eating disorder to kind of placate that trauma. So now that we take the eating disorder away, the trauma comes back to deal with, so we'll have to deal with those things. 
And um, when I say trauma, it could be really severe things or it could be small things, like I said, moving before or a breakup or something like that, or losing a parent, divorce, or those kind of things. So um, as we see the eating disorder sort of recover, we see some of those other issues come up that we have to deal with. And they, it gets really scary for them because they've never, they've never wanted to go there. They've kind of run away from it. So here it's coming back up again. Um, and but those skills that you learn when you start to deal with the, the trauma and all of that are great for the rest of your life because I'd love to say that these girls are war boys and I'm talking more about girls because I've dealt with more girls, but that you'll never have trauma again, but I try to tell them as they're leaving counseling and leaving and recovering that you can use these skills again. Your life is going to be up and down. There'll be times when you'll need this again. Not that you'll have to go back to having an eating disorder again, but when you start to feel low, you can start to put some of those skills back in place to help it not go down so low and come up quicker. Um, and then dealing with body image, because I think as a society we say it's just what we look like is our body image. Just this is what it is. And really to encompass everything. So our um, culture is part of our body image. Our intelligence is part of our body image. Our talents, our interests, all of those are part of who we are. And if someone is to judge us what you look like, obviously we do that initially, but you want someone to get to know you, and when they get to know you, be interested in you even more because you have a lot going on. You have interests, you have education, you have talents. Um, and trying to get them really in touch with all that because when you're so into an eating disorder, it really takes away everything else in your life because you want to isolate from others in terms of, I don't want to go out to eat because I don't know what's going to be there. I don't know if they're going to have pizza, and I don't eat pizza because pizza is really bad for me, and I won't have it. Or I don't want to go and they have birthday cake because I don't eat birthday cake, and everybody's going to ask me, why don't you eat birthday cake? Here's the birthday cake. Why don't you eat it? So I'm going to disconnect with everybody so they don't have to have those conversations. Or they will get where they want to pick where we're going. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you where we're going. I want to go to this place and not that place. And if you go to the other place, then I'm not going, and that kind of stuff. So it, it tends to divide. I've even had kids that not want to go on vacation because that's a whole week of where we're going to eat and what are we going to do and all that kind of stuff. And we've talked about purging with, um, with bulimia, but we see purge a bit with anorexia too in terms more of exercising too much. So if I'm going to eat that, then I'm going to go punish myself and work out for you know four or five hours. And we've had gyms tell girls you're not allowed here anymore because they look so bad when they leave because they work out so hard in order to take away, a purge all of those calories they had before. So um, obviously that's a big warning sign because other people in the gym have noticed, the people who own the gym or run the gym have noticed that you're overdoing it. So discontinuing all those behaviors is important. We do want them to exercise. <laughs> That. We're not trying to take that away. And a lot of times when they are very, very low weight and we're very concerned, their blood pressure may be really, really low and that's, that's scary, we'll say that you, you cannot exercise until you restore your weight because low blood pressure is not good and we could, um, we could see something really bad happen. But once they are close to restoring or restored, we want that they move their body. It's, it's good, it's healthy, but not the strenuous stuff like running for hours or working out for hours. We introduce a lot of yoga or like walking, you know, and even in a stress-reducing type of way that you could walk and talk with someone, you could walk the dog, you could have yoga, you could do yoga with others, and it's good and healthy for your body. It's more relaxing and refreshing, and so we talk in more terms of like how to help your body instead of punish it. Um, strength training training's not bad, low impact um, aerobics and then flexibility is really great. It's for enjoyment because a lot of them see it as punishment. Oh my gosh, I did this, now I must go punish myself about it. And so we're trying to get them into a better frame of mind about that. How can exercise be good for you? And then setting realistic goals. So we know that society doesn't really have realistic we see the models that are modeling. We see um, what people are saying about all of that. Um, fortunately, I feel like growing up in the 70s and the 80s and where we are now, we're seeing a lot more diversity. We're seeing a lot more of different body types being celebrated, thankfully. And so we're seeing a, a, that maybe girls can see people who look a little more like them and maybe hopefully feel more comfortable with who they are. Um, 
and making sure that it's age appropriate. So I've had girls that are already runners at like eight, nine years old. They're already in running clubs, they're already competing and stuff like that. Um, or gymnasts or cheerleaders who are already competing and they want to stay being a flyer, you know, and you're nine, you're going to go through puberty. We don't know what you'll look like after puberty. You may not be a flyer anymore. You might be a base and that's okay. But um, in their mind, it's not okay that they want to keep from doing that. So hopefully talking with coaches and I've had some things that I've heard that coaches said and I'm not, I don't know if it's true or not, but like talking with coaches and how they're approaching the subject of weight or body types and those kind of things. Um, talking with parents to make sure that they're being balanced about what they say and what they do. Um, I have to monitor sometimes what I say because what we said, okay, it was okay in the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. is not really appropriate anymore, you know, and thinking about how what I say comes across to her, how my daughter processes that. And I certainly want her to see that she's so much more than just a pretty face or some sports girl, that she's a whole person and that she should respect herself in all those ways. Um, and, and I think when we talk about healthy and balanced, we hear so much about being healthy and we hear all these diet plans where you take away this or you can't have that. And trying to talk to them about, you should be able to go to a birthday party and have birthday cake every once in a while. Like that's not something we're gonna eat every day, but you should be able to go to any place and be social and have a good time. And it shouldn't be like, oh, it's ruined my day or now I gotta go exercise for um, 10 hours or something. Um, but make sure that whatever they are doing is flexible, that they can go on vacation, they can go out, they can do things, and that they enjoy movement and they enjoy their life. Um, to be psychologically helpful, we must revise certain goals. So they may have the image that I'm only going to be happy if I'm perfect. I don't know anybody who's perfect. <laughs> There really isn't, it's not even attainable. It's not anything you can do. Knowing who you are and being happy with who she is and being the best you you can be and being okay with maybe you can't do everything. I'd love to sing like Beyonce. I think she's amazing. I think she's beautiful and she's talented. I'm not, I don't have those talents. So I believe in a higher power. That's not what he gave me. He gave me other talents. So celebrating what you are good at. Instead of looking at everything that you aren't so good at or didn't achieve and maybe comparing yourself against others, looking at what you do have going on really well and celebrating that and trying to do that even better. We talk about comparison is the thief of joy. So when you constantly compare yourself to others, you lose sight of everything that you have that's so great in your life. And it's really hard not to because we are a very competitive society to not want to be like everybody else. We even see it in the college right now. I'm a high school counselor here. We see that people are competing so much that they're doing illegal things to get their kids into schools. And I think that's part of a, a bigger you know, societal thing. But even within the family, if you can have those conversations about this is what you're really good at and this is what we're so excited about. And these are the things you're interested in. And maybe some of these things become your career or some of these things be your gift to other people. And looking at those things, developing a sense of who you are. And I think that's so very hard when you're young. And we're talking about high school mainly, but we see that when they enter intermediate school, like 10, 11 years old, until they get to be about 20 years old, is a huge development of who they are. And they've done studies where they see them at 10, 11, and they're so excited about who they are, and they know who they are, and I'm gonna be a baseball player, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do that. And then we start to crush them, like, oh baby, Football players, that's, there's only a few people that can become a football player. Oh, you need to make a better goal than that. Like, that's going to be too hard for you. You need to have to go to college for eight years for that. We start to, like, tell them all these things they can't do when we should really be celebrating, like, what are other things? You can do that. What's plan B? And let's do this. And what do you need to do for that? And, like, really re research it and let them make their decisions about it instead of, like, really – and I'm not just saying parents do that. I feel like – even as educators, we do it a bit because we want them to be so realistic, but yet they're not at an age where they can be realistic, and we should be trying to promote as much as we can. I think when they start to be a senior is when we really can have more realistic talks because they have a better sense of what's going on in the world. Not fully yet. I mean, I had a, I had a senior, I mean, a, he's 21 now. He'll be finished with college next year, and he wants to be a teacher. But when he was here, 
He just came to visit me today. When he was here, he was going to work at the same company he was already working at. He was going to continue to move up that company. And that was a great plan. I thought he could do far more because he took AP classes and stuff, and I thought, well, college and, you know, whatever from there. So I'm really excited. But at that time, I didn't crush what he wanted to do. I wasn't like, oh, that's stupid. It don't work there. You know, you can do better than that. I just would encourage him and say, I think that's a great plan. I think you're pretty realistic. I like that. But what about all these other things? And he told me that those were seeds that he, I planted way back then that grew later. And that's what we hope to do. We hope to plant little seeds. We don't know how they'll grow or when they'll grow or if they'll grow, but trying to encourage and more than. And I think it's hard as a parent because you really want, like, oh my gosh, all these good things I want them to grow up to be really great. That you want to sort of push them a certain way, but we just continue to grow that with them. Um, one of the big things we do with eating disorder girls is mindfulness, and we found that mindfulness is great in so many areas with ADD children, with anger issues, with eating disorders, um, with anxiety and depression, and mindfulness is trying to keep them in the moment. Instead of always worrying about the future and what's going to happen in the future, you make your plans and you sort of hope they go, maybe you have a plan A, B, C, D, but you kind of leave that to the future, and going back and trying to rehash everything from the past is not really that helpful because you can't go back and change anything. You can kind of rethink how you feel about those things, but you can't live back there and you can't live forward. <laughs> and so we try to keep them present and in the moment. Oh, yes. <laughs> they're um, they're for the next hour presentation. <laughs> no problem. They're like, okay, okay. Um, so trying to keep them in the moment and present even for us as adults, we're so busy with like, oh, I've got to get them to school and they have a project tomorrow and they have pictures and did I give them money for a gun on ice and blah, blah. But trying to be right there. I just made dinner. We're sitting down. Let's enjoy each other. Let's talk about how was your day? How do you feel? What's going on with you? And those kind of things instead of always being so busy about what's going on next. I call it being in robot mode where you're kind of accomplishing and crossing everything off your list, but you're not fully present in that moment. Because there's so much you have to get done. You're not in that moment. <clears throat> um, I had a couple of quotes there that um, a lot of people were wor are worried about. Um, they've had an eating disorder so long. How do I recover from it? It is possible. I was saying earlier, when we were kids, we would think, oh, you have an eating disorder. Oh, that's like a death sentence. You're not going to recover. We have a lot of good methods, and we are recovering a lot. The earlier that we detect it and the earlier we get help, the better. So if you know people, and I encourage children, I've talked to the health classes here, if you think something's going on, tell an adult, tell a counselor, tell a parent, tell a teacher, tell someone so that we can get some early detection because the earlier we intervene, the quicker they can recover and the better recovery. And now they did not just only for girls. Absolutely, absolutely. I didn't mention that much. We have a lot of wrestlers and boxers that have to get down weight so that they can be in the weight class that they want to box or a wrestle in. And so we see them starving themselves in order to do that. You're right. And I was saying earlier, there's later onset. So we've seen um, older people starting with eating disorders where we didn't see that before. But it has a lot to do with just instead of dealing with the emotions and the stress and the anxiety, we're doing the eating, not eating, and numbing ourselves to what's going on. My boy is boxing now, and he feels so great because he can yes. lose the mm -hmm. next round. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. right, right. It's, like <laughs> it's crazy. It really is. Right. Right. Too. Yeah. So this one, no, just vegetables would be with a little bit of rice. We need to talk more. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, and that's, that's a scary thing because they don't want to listen to what we have to say. They think yeah. they know it better. And uh, sports is one of our key things that we see a lot of kids getting so involved in sports. And by not eating properly, our kids can gain weight as well, can't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, and, and that's, um, we see with bulimics, because I said they're a little more um, in the outer ranges. They will eat things that are not good for them, and then they feel bad about them, and they want to purge it. And it's a purge of emotions, too, so that emotion of, like, oh, my God, I overate, I ate the wrong stuff, and now I need to get rid of it, that is a vicious cycle. Um, and so instead of, like, finding out proper nutrition and trying to eat well, they keep that vicious cycle going. So we try to break that. Um, but it's a journey for whatever age or whatever gender they are, and we certainly want to help them through that. Um, 
addressing the core eating disorder symptoms. So we want to find like what are those triggers? How do we replace those behaviors? Like I said, instead of binging and purging and binging and purging, what are the behaviors we can put in place instead to deal with the emotions and not need to? Because they may build up with emotions out. I got all those cookies out, but now I feel bad because I've just repeated that cycle again. So how do we break all of that? And, um, shame. I, Shame is a big part of this, and I want to give um, them examples of like how, as a parent, maybe we haven't always, maybe when we were in high school, we had problems, and we recovered from that. I give them examples that we're, we're not all perfect, and we can't do everything right all the time. And we don't expect that from them to be perfect, you know? So they sometimes think we do, just based on the fact that we're always pushing them to do their best. They think we think we want them perfect. We want them healthy. We want them happy. And how do we show them that? Um, treatment issues. Again, we, we see a lot um, of like, I think my family wants me to be this, so I'm being this, and I'm trying to do my best at this. And then how do we explain as a family that we want you to be healthy and happy, and we want to support you and be there for you? Um, and you can do that better without an eating disorder. And so we see that this particular person had a lot of those things, the symptoms or the um, onset that we were talking about before. Um, Body image, accepting changes, as we were talking about earlier, that um, as we go through puberty, we're going to have changes to our bodies, females and males, and accepting those changes and being okay with those, it's, it's scary for them. Um, respecting the changes and redoing our body image of what that is. Um, and then even like talking about the sexuality stuff, because uh, for women that can be some things. If they've been, um, the trauma's been some kind of sexual abuse, if I don't, have the curves, then maybe I don't attract the men, and then I don't have to deal with that. But we want to deal with that in a positive way, that it is good to have um, curves, and then it's not okay for the sexual abuse when we're dealing with those issues. <clears throat> um, demands versus resources. So again, we want to talk about like what um, stresses there are, and then who do we have in our life, and what help do we have in our life with those issues. How can we educate them on where to go and how to feel when they're feeling bad or who, what to do, what are the skills for that? Um, spirituality is a big part of it. Um, whether you're a religious person or not, we talk about um, being in the here and now and meditation is really, really great for that. Prayer is really great for that if you are a religious person and incorporating those things in. Being out in nature, uh, appreciating art are big things to help you to be more present and to be more um, appreciating of what's going on in life. And then incorporating our culture and our heritage and our traditions into all of that, celebrating who you are. Because we have a lot of diversity in our world. We have a lot of diversity in the school, and I think it's great we celebrate that and encourage that. Um, again, ambivalence, I mean that numbness. We're trying to resolve all of that, that they're not numb anymore, that they're really fully present, that they feel hunger, and they feel um, emotional cues, and that they can do something about that. So if you feel some sort of emotion, that you process that. Like we talked about going to watch a uh, um, sad movie if you're feeling sad, or go watch a happy movie if you don't want to be sad anymore. Or doing that for a little bit, and then not forever. We're not forever sad. We will be sad a proper amount of time, and then we go and do something else. We get busy with our lives. Um, be proud of our uniqueness, be confident in our knowledge and our experience and our wisdom as we age. For parents, I would say support groups are like so, so key. I know that we have some here. If you, don't, if you guys are interested, let me know. I can get you hooked up with one. But just hearing what other parents are going through, then you don't feel like you're the only one. You don't feel like you're different or that it's not okay, you find that others are having that same issue, and then you can hear what they're doing about it and how they're getting better at it. Um, family counseling, to have a counselor in there to say, hey, let's do it this way and try it that way, and um, even get the, your son or daughter, the client, to say, I need, them, I need this more, I need less of that. Um, and trusting the process. There's a lot of like questioning, is this the right thing? Should we should be doing this? Are they getting better? Is this, I think it's worse. Um, not, and not to comment on the physical changes, we talked about that before. Oh gosh, you're losing weight, look at you, or you're gaining weight, that's great. 
None of that, because all of that. I even went to say, someone was healthy and found out later, that's the opposite of what you should say, because yeah. healthy means something completely different. So healthy means you're full of health, you've got great coloring, it looks like you're doing better. For her, healthy meant I, I meant she was getting fat, and that's not what I meant at all. <laughs> but they, that's how it felt. Um, and then saying stuff like you should be proud of you, putting it more on them. Instead of like, I always have to tell you that I'm proud of you or that you're great, I, you always have to get that external praise from me. Figuring out how to praise yourself, how to feel good about yourself. I did good. I'm really proud of myself. I did great. And then if everybody else is proud too, that's great, but you know you did a good job. And not having to always seek that external praise. Um, remembering that we have a problem, but we're not the problem. And staying away from the blame game. The parent, I have a lot of parents that say, what did I do? How did I cause this? Why am I, you know, I'm the problem. And I say, please stay away from that. All together, because it is a big, perfect storm. There's genetic factors. There's environmental factors. There's societal factors. The hormonal factors. There's so much to it. And sometimes, we talked about earlier, you have more than one child, and they'll go through kind of the same stuff, but one takes it this way, and one takes it a different way. So it's not, it can't, if you didn't give all of it to them, then, you know, it's not just you. So remembering to stay away from all of that. I have some references, and I will share this with you guys if you like. But I thank you guys for uh, coming today. I appreciate it so much. Thank you.